welcome to our fifth episode of Conversations in Computational Photography, a new series by the Alice Camera team exploring uh, innovations in computational photography, deep learning, artificial intelligence, and how they can be applied to consumer digital cameras. I'm Vishal Kumar, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Alice Camera, and I'll be your moderator today. Let me introduce you to our CTO, Liam Donovan. He's a PhD electrical engineer who's the chief technical architect and innovator behind the Alice Camera. Hi, Liam. Hi, Vish. The second person joining us today is Vic Kumar. He's the chief operating officer of the company and runs the day-to-day -day operations, but he's also a graduate in physics and he is a practicing photographer. So hi, Vic. Hey, hi, Vish. Okay, so the topic this week is megapixels, and uh, megapixels is a usually sometimes can be quite divisive uh, and heated uh, topic, uh, and we're just going to kind of navigate uh, and meander around uh, the, the discussion of megapixels in relation to Alice. Um, and to kick things off, uh, Liam, like, what is a pixel? What is a megapixel? Sure. So a pixel, um, in the, in the context of camera sensor, a pixel is a, one very small. A light sensitive element in a camera sensor um, and that will eventually turn into one pixel on screen um, or one individual little little part of a picture. It's Megapixels a million. one million of those pixels yeah. I think, yes. Great. Yeah, thousand by thousand. Yeah, and uh, so that's pixel in, in terms of sensor but sometimes pixels are different in terms of a pixel of a sensor, a pixel of a smartphone screen, a pixel of a laptop screen a pixel or something else. So Vic, can you explain really high level, like a pixel on a sensor versus a pixel on a laptop screen or on, on a smartphone screen? Yeah, sure. So the kind of analogy I like to use is um, like tiles. So if, if you have tiles in a bathroom, you could have different size tiles. You could have Roman mosaic tiles, or you can have a large tile. But you need to tile a surface area, so a meter squared of, of your floor. And that could be done with a hundred small tiles or one big tile and it's very similar with uh, screens and with sensors so each pixel is is differing by the underlying size of the pixel yeah yeah that, that's actually a really good analogy i uh, didn't really think of it like that um it, it's a difficult topic because uh you know pixel size is also quite important uh and liam like what can you explain why a small tile or a big tile uh has a difference in terms of uh, the sensor's capability in particular so it comes down to noise. Um, noise is basically the, the enemy of all good photography. Um, and uh, so Im image sensors produce noise um, as a result of their kind of digital circuitry clocking away in the background. Um, like little electronic pulses kind of end up getting onto the actual pixel and changing the value of the pixel um, in a way that you can see, in a way that actually kind of ruins the way that the image looks if it's too, if it's too big. Um, all sensors produce noise um, to differing degrees. Um, but what's really actually important um, when it comes to how much that noise is affecting the image is signal to noise ratio. So that basically means how big the noise is compared to how big the signal that the sensor is supposed to be measuring is. Um, and the better that ratio is, the more, uh, the, the less you actually see the noise, the less you notice the noise, and the less the noise is a problem. Now, uh, one pixel will kind of produce roughly the same amount of noise given the same underlying sensor technology, uh, no matter the size of the pixel, more or less. Um, but the signal that a pixel will produce is much bigger um, when the pixel itself is bigger because more light can hit the pixel, um, so it produces a larger signal. Um, so bigger pixels produce a larger, better signal to noise ratio than smaller pixels, um, which is why bigger pixels can be desirable in certain situations. And the unit of measurement for the size of a pixel is a micron, is that is that correct? Yes, that's one thousandth of a millimeter. Right. Um, okay. So um, clearly like pixel size is important in terms of like signal to noise ratio. Why, why is it sometimes that, you know, Vic, people obsess about the, the number of, of megapixels, like, for example, 50 or, or 40 or 100? Sometimes you have smartphones talking about how they have 100 megapixels. Uh, why is that? Why is that metric become like the, 
the kind of spearhead of the conversation around sensors or sensor capability rather than the size of the pixel. Yeah, I think it was um, mainly done by the marketing teams, at these camera manufacturers and smartphone manufacturers, using a number that basically the bigger the number, the better the image quality. However, it, that's kind of far from the truth because there's, there's multiple elements to image quality above the megapixel count because a megapixel on one camera is, is most likely not the same as a megapixel on another camera. Um, so there, there's plenty of trade-offs uh, between having a larger megapixel versus actual image quality. And the, there are other things such as the, the lens um, capabilities of, of capturing the incoming light, the processing of the, the actual sensor data. So as Liam was mentioning, the, the signal to noise ratio and then also the processing power that is done through through the actual camera and the ISP itself to, to create that image that is displayed on the screen. Uh, and we've spoken about this in previous conversations, but essentially uh, a, the job of a pixel, right, is to process light. Uh, and it's to take that light and turn it into useful information uh, by capturing either red information green blue and you know sometimes all the all the blacks and, and whites and stuff and and we've spoken in the past about uh, especially in a previous conversation about color uh and how sensors you know uh, basically translate color but liam could you explain a little bit about what what actually happens under a pixel like there's terms such as bayer filters and there's there's other terms like quad bayer like what's really happening uh, at the pixel level uh, when it comes to processing this light and, and actually turning it into something useful? So, so um, pixels themselves are um, uh, very um, small bits of silicon, essentially, semiconductor silicon, um, which convert photons of light that hit them into electrons of electricity that can be measured and recorded and turned into a digital image. Uh, that those that semiconductor material um, is is just sensitive to light of any intensity. It has no kind of color sensitivity at all. Um, so a plain a plain image sensor would just be a monochrome image sensor. And actually, all all pixels are fundamentally monochrome uh, when when it gets down to it. But to uh, actually be able to record color. Uh, you have to uh, basically filter light that hits the pixels with special color filters. And this is the biofilter that you mentioned. So on top of um, an, an array of monochrome pixels on a standard image sensor, uh, you will have a bunch of very, very small red, green, green, and blue color filters individually on every tiny little pixel. Um, and this allows us to uh, measure different frequencies in the in the light, measure different colors, and actually then reassemble a color image from those that filtered light. Um, and this is the origin of biosensor, and that is how colors um, are able to be recorded with image sensors. Yeah, and to, to add to that, so the, the way the biofilter was originally designed was to replicate the human eye's um, uh, sensitivity to the, the color channels, the primary colors, red, green, and blue. So it's actually split 50% green, 25% uh, red and 25% blue to marry up with how the human eye perceives color. Yeah. Guys, can um, I just pause? I need to go out to the door. I'm pretty sure that's my PCBs and nobody else is answering it. Okay, sure. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Sorry. Liam had to pop out and grab an Amazon parcel. Uh, so now we're getting back to what we were talking about previously. We, we, had, we were kind of talking a little bit about Bayer filters and processing light through these pixels. Um, and what I wanted to jump off on was like, presumably there's a relationship, like the bigger the pixel size, the better it, it's going to be to process this red, green, blue uh, monochrome information. Is that broadly speaking correct, Liam, or, or, or not? Well, it's, so the, the bigger the pixel is, the more light it can capture, yes. Um, but there are trade-offs involved. Like the, the, um, the bigger the pixels are, the fewer pixels you can have within a, a certain size. Um, and that means actually less detail that you can capture. So there are there are trade-offs with these things. So you get you get you get much less noise with bigger pixels, but you do get less detail um, mm. as long as uh, like the optical system is actually capable of delivering that detail to the sensor. So so there are there are trade-offs with it. 
when you're when you've got this canvas on which you are viewing the megapixels, uh, for instance, yeah, a, a, a TV screen or, or or a 4K screen. You know, sometimes people obsess over 8K, but so, you know, it's not actually theoretically possible to view all of the pixels of an 8K video footage on these screens. Can you explain that bit a, a bit more, Vic? Like that? Yeah. That sure. your problem. Yeah. So so most. Um pixels that are captured on the sensor are captured by those individual pixels we we're discussing. But then they need to be replicated again on a digital screen or on a on a paper canvas and printed out. So it's the viewing screen. So it's replicating what was in real life and then replicating onto a viewing screen um, afterwards. And so a viewing screen is mainly made up of LEDs. And they have sub pixels within them within the red, green and blue channel. Um, but most screens in, in production nowadays can maybe do uh, 1080p or 4K. 1080p maxes out at 2.1 megapixels is what it can resolve on a screen. And 4K can resolve about 8 megapixels. So anything above that, you can't really see that output on a, on a digital screen. Yeah. Liam, do you have any perspectives on that uh, particular point? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of the key question is really how many how many pixels do you really need um, to display what you want to display and where you want to display it. And so if you're if you're filming for an IMAX um, an IMAX film or you're filming or you're or you're a photographer and you want to you know blow your picture up to the size of a size of a building and put on a billboard or something, then you need a lot of megapixels to be able to do that. But if what you want to do is make YouTube videos that people are going to watch on their phones and on their computers uh, and on their TVs, uh, you do not need hundreds of megapixels because most of that information is is simply thrown out. Um, uh, because as Vic said, those screens rarely go above 4K resolution. I mean, you can get 8K TVs these days and they probably will become more prevalent. But at the moment, most most people don't, don't need 4K. And actually there's very little benefit to having anything above 4K. Um, for most yeah. people using cameras in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to add to yeah. that, so a typical, the latest uh, M1 MacBook Air or MacBook Pro can only resolve about four megapixels. Uh, so it can't actually natively resolve 4K. It has an Apple 4K, which is a bit of a shrink down of uh, typical 4K, but most smartphones as well max out around 1080p or some some of the flagship ones do 4K. Yeah, I, I like to think of megapixels uh, as like analogous to a horsepower in a car. Like, it's great that you have a thousand horsepowers in your Ferrari, but if you're driving on the motorway, especially in, in the UK, you're limited to 70 miles per hour. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to take advantage of all those thousand horsepowers uh, when you're driving down the, uh, the motorway. Uh, but you can definitely boast about it to your mates when they come around <laughs> for dinner and you can tell them about how many horsepowers you have in your car. And I know it's kind of the same with, with a camera. You know, you can probably tell all your mates that you have 50 or 100 megapixels in your camera. But actually uh, making use of all those megapixels in real life situations or in the case of, of making a YouTube video may not necessarily make sense. Uh, and there's a great video that Chris Howe, um, who's a YouTuber, did uh, recently where he essentially um, printed, he used, I think, a Sony A7S III and um, potentially a 100 megapixel Fuji camera. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but he did use two different cameras, uh, one with 100 megapixels, one with 12. Uh, and he showed it to Lizzie Pierce, uh, Daniel Schiffer, and Peter McKinnon. Uh, and most of their answers were wrong because he, he printed out uh, photos uh, by a 12 megapixel sensor and, 100, and 102. And he said to these people, hey, can you tell me which one is which? Uh, and they got it wrong, like pretty much, I think they got every single one wrong, apart from maybe one of, yeah, I can't really remember, but the majority were wrong. So I definitely check that video out. Um, let's move to Alice. Uh, let's move to uh, why the megapixel count in Alice, which um, is around 10.3 or 11 megapixels, depending on uh, how you chop and change it, really. Um, but Liam, can you explain to the audience why um, Alice has 11 megapixels and maybe mm. the composition of those pixels uh, uh, in relation to the discussion that we've been having so far? Sure. So uh, there are quite a few uh, reasons that, that kind of fed into the decision to go with the, the sensor that we've got. Um, 
uh, so the, the the main one in terms of resolution was we wanted a sensor that that would do native 4K video uh, without having to crop and without having to resample in uh, inside the camera to make the to make the image smaller to fit inside a 4K frame. Um, to do that, you need just over eight, maybe nearly nine megapixels um, to do that. Um, if you have a sensor that is any bigger than that, you have to either crop in order to produce accurate 4K resolution, which means that you're actually using less sensor area, and so you're, you're effectively using a smaller sensor when you do that. Or you have to resample in post, which is a very kind of energy and power consuming and, and, and processing power consuming process to do. Um, and, and so uh, in order to get kind of the best quality video in the most efficient way, you really want uh, eight to nine megapixels that fill the frame of your camera. And that's exactly what the sensor on Alice does. Um, in 16-9 uh, or 17-9 aspect ratio, um, it, it has exactly the number of pixels that are required for a 4K uh, film, 4K, 4K movie. And so there's absolutely no post processing required to do that. Um, so that was that was one thing we were looking for. Um, there are a few others. Um, so Alice's sensor um, is very similar to the sensor that is in the GH5S and the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. Uh, those uh, cameras are, are, are very, very good at video um, uh, because of the sensor. Um, but there are a couple of other really interesting features that this sensor have that were really ahead of its time when the sensor was released and which are really only available in very high-end sensors even now that actually really, really help um, the sensor's image quality. Um, and uh, they are, uh, one is uh, BSI, Backside Illuminated Technology. Um, so this technology basically allows you to remove the electronic wiring from the, surf, the, the top surface of the sensor where the light hits it, put it on the back of the sensor, which allows you to make the pixels bigger um, without increasing the size of the sensor, which gives you a better signal to noise ratio. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a technology that's been around for a few years now, but still it's not available in all uh, pro cameras that you can get. Not, not, all, not all sensors will have BSI, and only kind of quite high-end cameras tend to have BSI sensors still, even now. Uh, there is a, another really important feature called dual gain ISO. Um, and this is a really unusual uh, feature that makes the sensor perform really, really well in low light. Um, so it basically allows you, instead of increasing the ISO, uh, as the kind of the light goes down and you need to kind of increase the light that your camera is capturing, you can actually switch to this high gain ISO mode uh, that acts as if it were at just 100 or 200 ISO, but uh, or actually amplifies the signal as if the ISO was really high. So you basically get a high ISO without any of the noise. Um, and this is, again, a really, really useful feature for low light photography. Uh, because uh, you can you can produce uh, images in low light that just that really have very very low noise as if they were captured during the day. Um, and there is one final feature that the sensor has, which is also really quite unusual and also really only found usually in in high end smartphone sensors, actually not even in in high end pro cameras, uh, and that is quad buyer HDR. Um, and so with quad buyer HDR or with the kind of quad buyer HDR that we have in Alice because it differs from sensor to sensor, uh, each pixel is actually split into four sub pixels. Um, and then you can read out half of those sub pixels at one shutter speed and then half of the pixels at a slightly long shutter speed, but at exactly the same time. This actually gives you two images um, captured at the exact same moment from the exact same position, but with different exposure values. Um, and this allows you to uh, increase the dynamic range uh, that you're able to capture using the sensor very significantly um, and without doing any computational tricks um, to do that. Um, so you can basically just combine those two images that you capture at different exposure times into one with a much higher dynamic range. And this allows us to do that, uh, capture much higher high dynamic range uh, in video where you, where you don't need to do any processing and, and, and uh, then feed into our computational high dynamic range processing, which increases it even further. Um, so yeah, there's a quick rundown of some of the advantages of our, of our sensor. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's really, really thorough. And um, 
you know, answers a question that it's, even though you may have more megapixels, uh, it may not necessarily mean that you have all the other benefits that you've just described in terms of the sensor that we have. Vic, do you have any particular perspectives on Alice's sensor and the discussion around 11 megapixels and, and why we decided to go with this sensor over potentially other sensors? Yeah, so um, having 11 megapixels on a micro four thirds camera means that we've got one of the largest uh, possible underlying pixel size. So each individual pixel is, is significantly larger than say if we went with uh, doubled it and went 22 megapixels, we just have half the individual uh, pixels. So we'll have double the amount of pixels, but each pixel will be half the size. And so they will each pixel will be able to capture less light themselves versus one, one pixel that can capture more light uh, itself and, and hence the signal to noise ratio. But also the the micro four thirds, I'd like to, to, to go into that conversation slightly around that sensor format size um, compared to other sizes. So it's kind of an optimal size. It's one of the, if not the smallest professional um, sensor size with a interchangeable lens uh, format. And so it gives gives many benefits in terms of overall package of a camera. So you've got a compact camera with actually very compact lenses. So interchangeable lenses are, are one of the key benefits of larger sensors and being able to have good optics. So I've got a 14 to 140 um, millimeter lens here and it's pretty compact, quite small, fits within my hand. Um, and this has got the full focal range, so a full frame equivalent of 28 to 280 millimeters within my hand, um, weighs about 150 grams and cost me about 150 pounds off eBay. That equivalent um, on a full frame Canon, uh, Canon do one, I believe a 14 to 300 will cost you over a thousand pounds. It weighs close to two kilograms and it's about four times the size. So you've got to lug around heavy, heavy kit to get the exact same focal distances. All very good points. And I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the point about costs and the point about size and, and slugging around especially is quite sensitive for uh, run and gun uh, YouTubers or, or people who just want to create quick video content in the moment that's of high quality uh, and that has, you know, blurred backgrounds and everything else that goes with it. Um, so yeah, definitely. I, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the computational trickery that goes, uh, uh, that has been applied to, to imaging sensors over the last five years or so. Uh, and a lot of the computational photography you see is being applied to smartphone sensors and these are typically quite small. Uh, but they're, you know, the effectiveness and uh, of, of computational photography techniques and methods uh, is somewhat related to the size of the megapixel, but also the number of megapixels. Is that correct? Uh, could you describe like the relationship between the effectiveness of computational photography and megapixels? Sure. So um, the 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 key um, the kind of the key thing that smartphone manufacturers realised that they could do to improve the quality of their very small, quite low quality quality sensors is actually capture multiple. Uh, shots in very quick succession uh, and then combine them together um, in order to reduce the amount of noise in the image to increase the quality of the image to increase the color reproduction accuracy um, and they use very clever algorithms to actually capture to to blend those um, images together without getting artifacts when there's motion in the scene and this sort of stuff they're able to do that because they have very very powerful processes in their in their in their smartphones uh, and this technique really is the what, what makes uh, images captured by a smartphone look almost, uh, as long as you don't look too closely, almost like they've been captured by a pro camera. Because um, if you actually look at a raw image captured by a smartphone without those sorts of computational tricks, they look terrible. They're, they're very noisy. They have very poor detail. They have very, you know, lots of bad issues with them. Um, and uh, this kind of multi-shot blending technique is, is the basis of <clears throat> many of the most interesting parts of computational photography. And what you actually need to be able to practically do those sorts of techniques on a mobile device that's powered by a battery is a firstly very powerful processors. Uh, that's something that you don't get in, in pro cameras these days. Um, 
Uh, but secondly, you need to be able to read the pixels out of your sensor very quickly because you need to be able to capture um, many shots very close together with small amounts of movement between them. Um, and uh, this is something that is that, that is helped when you have smaller megapixel counts because it takes time to move, um, you know, 50 million pixels from a sensor to a processor. That it takes a lot of time to move. That it's, it's actually a huge amount of data. Um, when you when you get up into these high megapixel, uh, can, like camera sensors, you know, the the amount of data in a 50 megapixel image is absolutely colossal. Um, whereas the amount of data in a 10 megapixel image, it's still very, very large, but it's a lot less, um, you know, by you know, factor of five in that case. But, um, it, you know, that, that and that makes a very, very big difference to firstly to how fast you can actually read the data out of the sensor. Uh, and then secondly, to how you can actually or how much processing you can actually do on those on those images, um, because the uh, computational processing to do that multi shot stacking scales uh, very strongly with resolution. So the more resolution you have, the more expensive it is. Um, and it's it's simply not practical to do multi-shot stacking on 50 megapixel images um, on cameras currently, really. Um, even even with very, very high-end processors, so they, they would struggle with that. Um, so there's really really big benefits to having to having a lower megapixel cam. So I was, I was just going to add, um, in terms of the overall camera package, uh, the more megapixels, the more processing. Uh, so in essence, like an engine, the process an engine. So it needs more fuel. So you need a you need a bigger battery, or you would have lower battery life. Um, there's a bit of a trade off. So if you want to process more megapixels, potentially you could do it with the same battery, but then your battery might only last you half an hour. Whereas if you're processing five times less, um, that battery could last you five times more. So there is a trade off between power and energy consumption as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So to make that point more concrete, like. The reason, one of the reasons why it makes sense to have an 11 megapixel sensor with Alice is because uh, with, a, with a large surface area sensor, like a micro four thirds sensor, uh, and with the battery that we have in Alice, applying these computational photography techniques that we've been talking about over the last couple of months on, on, this, on this series uh, is much easier and much more effective uh, and, and costs less in terms of compute and, and power. Um, and allows us to uh, do some of this kind of computational trickery. I'd like to just talk a little bit about kind of increasing the resolution using computational methods. Uh, so obviously you have, uh, we have an 11 megapixel sensor and Liam, you mentioned that um, 11 megapixels may mean less detail potentially. Uh, but there is an algorithm called super resolution that allows you to increase the resolution of an image using computational photography. Can we talk a little bit about super resolution and maybe other machine learning and deep learning techniques that are helpful for uh, megapixel counts? Okay, yes, super resolution is a uh, really exciting uh, uh, new kind of capability, a uh, new, 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 new kind of class of algorithm, which allows you to uh, increase the resolution of an image um, uh, beyond what the optical system that you're using is capable um, of producing, uh, and this is—it's kind of magic, actually. You know, it's—it's it's like those old-fashioned um, enhance memes. You can actually create. You can use artificial intelligence to create new detail inside an image um, at a higher resolution than than the input, um, and you can actually do this now on Adobe Lightroom, even, um, and some mobile phones offer this capability as well. Uh, but I, there, are, there are two different kinds of super resolution, actually. Um, there is single image super resolution, which is this sort of ma like magic uh, algorithm where the AI that you're using actually hallucinates detail that isn't there in the image based on its experience of, of what it thinks should be there. But then there's also another kind of super resolution, which is multi-shot super resolution. And this is where you take, again, you take a, lots of different images in very quick succession, you know, bursts of eight, 16, maybe even more images uh, of a scene uh, with you know, small amounts of movement in between them. And then you can actually use an AI again to combine the image from, those, from that burst into a single image with much higher resolution. Um, and in those sorts of algorithms, the AI isn't hallucinating the detail. It's actually combining detail from multiple shots. And particularly if you're taking those images handheld, 
the very small movements that you make while you're holding you're, you're, you're holding your camera actually mean that the image is moving about kind of on, on the sensor a very very small amount and this allows you to, to to capture information that would fall between the cracks if you like um, from a single image um, and then the AI is actually able to recombine all of that image all of that information back into a single image um, to produce a high resolution image that has not had details imagined, that has just had details reassembled from multiple images. Uh, and this is really exciting for me. And this is something that we are uh, looking into and working on. We, I, I, we can't say that we've got a multi-shot super resolution working on Alice right now, but it is something we are working towards and something that we think Alice will be able to do in the relatively near future. Um, and it's something that I think is really interesting because it allows you to have all of the benefits that we've been talking about today of a low resolution sensor, um, all of those benefits to signal to noise ratio and computational processing capacity and all of that stuff. But it also allows you to have, when you want it, the benefits of a high resolution sensor so that you can take, uh, you can capture much more detail from a scene. You can really zoom in, you can crop and all that sort of, all that sort of good stuff. And so, yeah, super, super resolution is something that is, in the process of changing photography quite significantly. Um, and it's something that we're definitely looking to harness with Alice um, and, and we're working on actively. Cool, I think this conversation has been quite uh, broad and expansive and we've covered a lot of different uh, topics and we've covered a lot of different bases. Um, and I'd like to just conclude and wrap up by saying that um, usually, uh, when camera companies sell you higher megapixel counts or when your mates or whatever sell you higher megapixel counts, it's probably just a lot of marketing mumbo jumbo and uh, it's not necessarily uh, what you what you may may need. It, you know, it could just be the fact that uh, camera companies want you to spend more money on a, a more expensive sensor and buy into lenses that are, that are more, more uh, expensive. Uh, they, you know, that's kind of a, a lot. A lot of that marketing uh, is is very interesting. But as we've gone through this discussion, uh, we've spoken about um, the, we've spoken about kind of different screens, and it might may not necessarily um, mean that you need 100 megapixels to, to actually display it on your iPhone screen when watching a 4K video, uh, just because of uh, limitations to 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 the pixel count on a screen. Um, there are, you know, there are ways of using machine learning and software AI techniques to increase the resolution, as we've just discussed uh, towards the end, uh, to, to get uh, similar um, benefits that, that you may uh, get from a higher megapixel sensor. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting, innovative techniques that are being developed, that we are actively exploring, and that we are looking to bring to a camera like Alice so that you as the user can gain access to uh, and and can benefit from. So uh, if you're interested in any of uh, these kind of new techniques that, that we've spoken about, then please do go over to the alice.camera uh, website and take a look at what we're proposing and offering. If you'd like to join the conversation, uh, please join our Facebook group. It's called the Alice Camera VIP group. Um, it recently passed 600 members and is growing quite substantially. And we've got tons of really interesting people in the group who are interested in computational photography, the innovations that AI can bring to the table and what we're doing. And uh, yeah, if you want to join that conversation, please do join. Um, in the meantime, uh, we I'm not entirely sure what our next conversation will be. We'll have a thought and uh, we'll be getting something out soon. But I'd like to thank uh, Liam and Vic again for their time to have this discussion. Uh, as I said right at the beginning, Megapix was always a uh, heated and divisive uh, topic. But um, I hope you now have a bit of a better understanding of some of the decisions we've made uh, with Alice's sensor and how um, many elements of it are quite sophisticated in terms of its, its technology. So yeah, thanks a lot for your time, guys. Uh, and we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Cheers.